Good morning. And I asked one of the Kids Connect leaders if I could be one of the kids waving the, the palm branches. He told me I was too old, but don't worry. I'm not too tall. Okay, that's better. Well, either way, I'm not that bitter about it, so don't worry about it. Anyway, all right, hey, grab your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 16. It was uh, a few years ago, I came home one day from work, and I came home, and I could tell right away my wife was really excited about something, I didn't know what it was, and I'm like, what's going on? And she says, well, guess what I've decided? I'm like, okay, what? She says, we're going to the state fair this year. I don't, I don't know what kind of response she expected from me. Um, I, I have some memories of going to the State Fair from when I was a kid when it was in Lincoln. And I remember thinking it was possibly one of the most boring days of my life. So I don't know exactly what was expected of me, but I'm like, okay, I guess we're going to the State Fair. Anybody been to the State Fair in Grand Island? Like, we had a great time. Like, we had so much fun that we've, I think for the last few years, we've kind of gone every year, but there just seems to be like one thing about the State Fair that every single one of our family members really likes. For my wife, it's the birthing barn. If you've never, uh, if you've never grown up uh, around a farm, like the idea of watching animals give birth is like kind of weird, um, but seeing like little baby pigs and little baby goats and things like that, like that's, she loves that. Um, I have another daughter who really loves dogs. And they've got like one of those like professional like dog frisbee show things that she looks forward to every year. Uh, for me, it is the exhibition hall. And I don't know if you've ever been here. It's this gigantic building that is just full of tables of people trying to sell you stuff. Okay? Which, that's not the part that I like. But the thing that I do like is that I know that every year inside that building is going to be those massage chairs. You know what I'm talking about, right? This is not like a recliner with like a little massaging unit in it. This is like a spaceship that is full of pillows. And inside those pillows are little tiny men that just massage you to sleep. And I never have really understood how they ever sell one of these things. Because I don't know, once somebody gets in, they never get out. Like, how does anybody try them out? Like, because when I get in... Like, there is nothing outside of this spaceship that would ever get me to say, yes, I'm leaving this for that, right? This is better than whatever you have out there. Um, and I thought to myself, and, you know, I'm such a sucker because this is what they want. They want you sitting in the chair and thinking the entire time about whether or not you want to buy one, right? So I thought to myself, man, I want one of these chairs. So, let's see, if I gave up my birthday and Christmas presents for four years, maybe five years, like maybe, maybe we could buy this chair. If I just sacrificed all presents for the next four or five years, I could do it, okay? So the guy walks by and the salesman walks by and says, well, how much is this chair? And he goes and checks in his book and of course he's a salesman. He comes back, well, hey, these chairs are only on sale. They're only this price during the state fair. I can sell you this chair for $9,600. Okay, so now my birthday and Christmas presents, we're reaching triple digits of years at this point as I'm quickly doing the math. And it's like I love the chair, but I, apparently I never really considered the true cost of the chair. I would never considered the cost. And so this Easter season, obviously there is so much focus and there's so much attention on the cross. And I want to ask a question this morning, and it's a question that I think that Jesus asks his disciples. and says, have you considered the cost of the cross? Have you considered the cost of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus? And uh, we start here in Matthew 16. It starts in verse 21, but the context of this, where we're going to pick up in 21, is a conversation that Jesus has with his disciples that may be familiar to some of you. Uh, so Jesus asks his disciples, you know, as you guys are walking around, as you guys are interacting with people, tell me, who, who are people saying that I am? The disciples say, oh, some people say you're this, and some people say you're this person, some people say you're that. And Jesus looks to his disciples and says, who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter traditionally is sort of the mouthpiece of the disciples. He speaks up, he says, well, you're the Son of God, you are the Messiah, and to, to paraphrase Jesus' response here, I think, is that 
Jesus saying, yes, Peter, you were right. I am the Messiah, but maybe not the Messiah that you think I am. At least not, right, at least not yet. Okay, and here's what he says, verse 21. And I'm just going to read just a few words here. I'm going to stop right in the middle of his thought here. But he says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples This point in the Gospels marks a very specific point in time in which Jesus begins to change the way that he speaks to his disciples about his death and his resurrection. It's a a very clear, almost marking point change in the way that Jesus communicates with them. Before, in reference to his death and his resurrection, we see examples of of, uh, veiled language, right? That Jesus isn't 100% clear, he's not 100% obvious as to what it is that he's trying to say so that only those who knew Jesus for who he was would hear him and understand, okay? So you look at uh, John chapter 2, for instance, uh, the Jews asked Jesus, give us some sort of sign. What is your sign that you have the authority to say the things that you're saying? Show, tell us something of where you get your authority as to how you're able to do what it is that you are able to do. And what is Jesus' response? Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Okay, kind of veiled language, you with me, right? He's not just outright coming out and saying, well, my authority is going to be based on what's to come, right? John chapter 3, Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. So God told Moses to put, put a snake up on a pole and hold it up and so that Israel could look to it and that they would find healing. We're not going to look too much into that passage, but Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness... So the Son of Man must be lifted up. That when Christ is lifted up on the cross, people will find healing and eternal life through faith in Him. Right? And so He doesn't, he doesn't just come right out and say super clearly what it is that, he, that He's getting at. But this point in time marks a very, a very distinct change where Jesus' language gets very clear to His, to his disciples. Um, and so He began to explain to His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. And so I, I want to focus on just on just a few words here, and it's, and it's wording that I'm actually not taking from Matthew 16, it's wording that I'm taking from uh, Mark's telling of this, of this story in, in his gospel, um, where he gives a, Mark gives a little bit more information than what Jesus actually says, is that the Son of Man must suffer. Okay, so I want to focus just real quickly just on that phrase when Jesus says that the Son of Man must suffer. Son of Man, a, almost a favorite title of Jesus for himself. A no, number of times that Jesus uses the phrase the Son of Man. So, so we have to understand what is the mindset, what is it that they would have thought about when Jesus uses that phrase, Son of Man. And it would have taken them probably immediately back to Daniel chapter 7. And I'll read it for you. This is Daniel. Daniel has a vision. Uh, He says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And listen to the description of who this son of man is. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. What is the mindset? What is the picture that they would have had at the phrase Son of Man? It would have been that of God coming, ruling, reigning in his glory, being worshipped, that the Son of Man was God. And I, I remember a few years ago, um, we as a church, we invited a, a speaker by the name of Nabil Qureshi here to speak. Uh, I don't, some, many of you maybe were here, some of you maybe have never heard that name before. A, uh, he was a Muslim, came to faith in Christ, and, and soon after that um, began speaking to groups, and he was writing some books, and, and it just was really amazing for a guy so young, probably in his mid to late 20s, God just began opening all kinds of doors for this guy to have opportunities to speak truth, to speak the gospel to hundreds, thousands of people, and particularly to Muslims about Jesus. Um, Unbelievable story, unbelievable life. Um, Joined uh, Ravi Zacharias, traveled with Ravi, um, 
and spoke to thousands and thousands of people. A couple years ago, Nabil uh, was diagnosed with cancer and passed away this last September. And I remember sitting at, at Midland, where we had him speak, and there was one thing that he said that, that has always stuck with me, is that what was it, what was one of the main things as a Muslim that, that changed his thinking, for maybe lack of a better phrase, what was it that started him down the path of eventually putting his faith in Jesus Christ? And he said, it was when I read Daniel chapter 7, when he read about the Son of Man returning again, ruling, reigning in glory, establishing his throne. Okay, so whoever that Son of Man is, that that Son of Man is God. I mean, he knew that from reading Daniel chapter 7. And then as he's reading through the Gospels, and he sees the number of times that Jesus continues to refer to himself as the Son of Man, that the light bulb goes off in his mind, and he says, okay, Jesus is not a prophet of God. Jesus is God. And it was that transition that led him down the path to eventually putting his faith in Jesus Christ. Um, so that is the, that's the mindset that Israel would have had as Jesus is referring to himself as the Son of Man. And Jesus is bringing together two ideas that really should not make sense to them. That the idea of the Son of Man, that he's God, that he's king, he's worthy of worship, he's worthy of, 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 uh, worthy of a throne, he is a king. That this king is going to suffer that he's going to be betrayed, that he's going to be killed. He says, not only is this going to happen, he says it must happen. If you happen to write in your Bibles, circle that word must. It's huge in this passage. He must suffer, not that he did suffer, not that he was going to suffer. He must suffer. We know from the message of the gospel, all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. The wages of those sin, the wages of that sin is death. That God in his holiness, God in his righteousness, we have wronged him because of our sin. And I, I came across this illustration. Anytime someone has been wronged, there's always a debt to be paid. Okay, I'll, I'll explain that maybe a little bit more here. Anytime there's a wrong... There's always a debt to be paid. And I can't, like I was going to say just a second ago, I came across this illustration. I thought it was perfect for what we're talking about. Imagine you invited some friends over to your house. Okay, and while your friends are spending time in your house, one of them bumps into your favorite lamp, gets knocked over, it's broken, shattered into pieces. Okay? There's a debt to be paid. You have been wronged. Okay? Right? Now you have a couple different options, right? You can make that person pay for that debt. Right? You can say, hey, that lamp was 50 bucks. You owe me 50 bucks. Right? That's an option. Right? Another option is, is you can pay for it. You can go out and buy a new lamp. I mean, obviously you could forget the whole thing and not buy a new lamp, but still you're suffering in some kind. You're walking around in darkness now where there once was more light. I mean, it cost you something to not make that person pay for it. Right? Are you following this? Uh, imagine... Um, the example being something a little more serious than a lamp. Imagine something, somebody does something to you that is so painful that somebody does something to you that hurts you so bad that they literally have stolen your happiness in life. Maybe some of you have been through things that you might classify, you might put in that category. Um, you have the same options, I think. You can make that person pay for it. You can find some way to, to take away that person's happiness, right? You can find a way to make that person pay for it. Or I can forgive and I can suffer and struggle through the releasing them of guilt. That I can suffer not receiving the justice that I feel like I deserve. You still following me? Forgiveness always involves suffering. Forgiveness always involves suffering. And Jesus is saying, you've wronged God because of your sin. Someone pays. There's a debt that has to be paid. I could let you pay for it. 
I can let the wrath of God come out onto the sins of every single one of us, or Jesus is saying, I can pay. I can take the wrath of God on the cross so that forgiveness would be possible for you. He says, I must go to the cross. Someone's got to pay. But it's not, I mean, it's not as if the cross was some kind of defeat on God's part and the resurrection just kind of bailed God out from that defeat. You follow me? It's not as if that was like a loss in, in God's column and the resurrection undid that loss. It's not as if the cross was a diversion from the plan. It's not as if the cross was an unexpected downfall of the plan. The cross was the plan. It's always been the plan. I must suffer. Look at Peter's response, verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Peter's not having it. Jesus, I don't know what you're talking about, but there's no way it's going down like that. There's no way the Son of Man coming in authority, coming in power, coming in glory is going to suffer, be betrayed, and die. That's not happening. Let this be a warning to us anytime we try and debate with Jesus in matters of theology. Okay? Imagine the, maybe the arrogance of Peter in this moment. Let me, let me just take just a minute, Jesus, and correct you on theology just for one minute. Okay? Jesus turned to Peter. Get behind me, Satan! <laughs> what a response. You are a stumbling block to me. Why so harsh? Why so harsh? Why such a harsh response from Jesus about this? Get behind me, Satan. And I think it's because this is not the first time that Jesus has ever heard this. This is not the first time that Jesus has been tempted with this idea before. Matthew chapter 4, Satan is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. What did Satan tempt him with? Tempts him once, tempts him twice. Third time, takes Jesus up on this high mountain and says, Jesus, I want you to look at everything. Look at all the cities, look at all the, all the, the nations and the kingdoms as far as the eye can see. I will give all of this to you. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. As if all of that didn't belong to God anyway, what is Satan tempting Jesus with? Satan is not tempting Jesus with a kingdom Satan is tempting Jesus with a crossless kingdom. I'll give, this all, I'll give all this to you any, right now. If you want it, I'll give all of this to you. Just don't go to the cross. Satan is not as afraid of a king on a throne as he is a king on a cross. And it's a theme throughout his life. Jesus in Gethsemane, right? Praying to God, God, if there's any way for you to take this cup from me, what cup? Jesus, is there any way that we can solve this, that we can pay this debt without a cross? Jesus knows the answer very quickly is no. It's always been the plan. That the Son of Man must suffer that God has, has decided that it is the will of God that he will pour out his wrath, that he will make his own son pay so that forgiveness would be available to all of us. It's so as if Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, get behind me, Satan. I've heard this before. This is not a new idea to me, Peter. Peter. <laughs> You think I haven't thought about a crossless solution to this? The end of verse 23. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter had his own agenda. Peter had his own plan. Peter had his own ideas as to, way, as to the ways in which he thought God should do things. And when those two ideas butted heads, Peter's agenda, God's will, and the cross... Peter said, no, 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 Jesus, let me, let me fix you. <laughs> let, me, let me fix your thinking on this. Um, 
But the cross has always been the plan. Uh, I, have a, uh, I have a picture up here. And I wonder if any of you have ever seen this before. Okay, this is Apple's Terms and Conditions Agreement, which I'm assuming many of you have seen because Apple changes their terms and conditions probably about every two days, okay? Um, and if you don't have an iPhone, I'm sure Android has their own, you know, similar version to this. Um, how, raise your hand if you've ever seen this, if you've ever agreed to this, right? Okay, put your hands down. Now I want you to raise your hand again, and I want you to lie to me that you have read those terms and conditions when you said agree. Put your hand up if you've read them. You liar. Dan, I'm just, actually, Dan, I probably believe that you have read that, actually. Okay. Now, Dan's probably heard this then before, but I want to read you something that you agreed to. Okay? You ready? Okay, this is about seven lines of content, and it's all one sentence, and it's in complete legalese. So, Hang with me, okay? You further acknowledge that the Apple software and services are not intended or suitable for use in situations or environments where the failure or time delays of or errors or inaccuracies in the content, data, or information provided by the Apple software or services could lead to death, personal injury, or severe physical or environmental damage. What is happening when I'm using my iPhone, <laughs> including, without limitation, the operation of nuclear facilities, aircraft navigation or communication systems, air traffic control, life support, or weapons systems. So, Apple is not liable if iTunes stops working while you're operating a nuclear facility. <laughs> you aware of this? Okay, if your iPhone fails while you are operating your surface-to-air missile, they want nothing to do with it. Okay, did you have any idea you were agreeing to that? Okay, nobody reads that. Nobody reads the terms and conditions. But Jesus here is about to lay out, and he says, I hope you've read it. <laughs> He's about to lay out the terms and conditions of the cross. Okay, this is what it means to be a disciple. These are the terms and conditions that, that we are agreeing to. Verse 24, it says, And Jesus said to his disciples, and it's very clear here that Jesus now is turning his attention away from Peter and to his disciples, to all of his disciples. He said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. He's calling all disciples to consider the cost of following him. That you must first deny yourself. And that's about the idea that life is no longer, life's no longer about me. It's not about my identity. It's not about my agenda. The cross is a call to let go of your hold on your future, on your work, on your free time, on your kids, on your finances. That when we live in such a way, when we live so tight-fisted about our lives, our plan, our agenda, our stuff, the people that we care about, that what seems like life to us actually ends up resulting in just the opposite. Okay, so like times in our lives when we just get really, really angry about something, it really feels in that moment like life to respond harshly to that person, to win the argument. That feels right. That feels like life. But in the end, it's going to lead to, in essence, the death of that relationship. You know, in our materialism, it feels a lot like life to get that thing, that massage chair. No, I'm just, whatever. Just kidding. It feels a lot like life to get that thing, um, whatever that is for you, fill in the blank, and that I'm willing to spend and spend and spend to get that, all of the while disregarding the opportunities that I might have to use those finances to be involved in, in God's purposes in people's lives, to minister to people, to help people have the opportunity to hear about Jesus who don't know Jesus, that you've traded in your hand in God's work in people's lives for this thing Whatever it is. 
that it, we easily confuse things that bring life with things that actually bring death. Um, and so we must deny ourselves. It says, take up your cross. Now listen, take up your cross is not a list of things, whatever we can come up with, that we would consider first world problems. Listen, taking up your cross is not losing your spare iPhone charger. You know, taking up your cross is not when your GPS sends you the wrong direction. You know, it's not like, oh man, I'm so tired from my vacation. I just need a vacation after my vacation. You know, we all have our crosses to bear. Um, no, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of silly. But that's, in a lot of ways, maybe that's kind of how we tend to, tend to think about it. Um, but Jesus is saying, remember that the cross has been my plan this whole time. And look at the cross that my son went through. That he was betrayed. He was imprisoned. He was tortured. He was killed. And then glory. He says, if you want to follow me, it's the same path. That standing for Jesus in this life very well mean that you stand alone. It very well mean, mean that, that you are belittled. It may mean pain. It may mean rejection. It may mean dying to yourself, dying to your wants. Particularly, I think, in this postmodern culture and very quickly becoming post-Christian culture that you will be considered ignorant, you will be considered unintelligent, you will be considered uneducated simply just because of your faith in Jesus Christ. That whatever it is that you have built up for yourself, whatever, whether that's financially, whether it's in your status or in your career or in your reputation, taking up your cross and saying, Jesus, let it all come down. In comparison to Christ, it all means nothing. And it's a comparison that Jesus makes here in just a second, which we'll look at. But Paul worded it this way. I've got uh, Philippians 3, 7, and 8 up here on the screen. Paul writes, says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. He's making the exact same comparison that everything that I could gain in this world, by comparison, it's ridiculous. It's not even close. And that's how Jesus ends here. Jesus ends his conversation here by um, challenging us to consider the value of the cross. Verse 25, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. You know, I'm not going to spend probably a lot of time here, but just to say this, that if you could ask for anything in this world, no matter what it is, and, and you knew that right now I'd give it to you, Okay, whatever that is, if you think about something, how would you answer that question, right? Just in your own mind. If you wanted something and knew that you could have it right now, what would it be? But the question that he's asking is, is that what item could you ask for that you would trade for eternal life? Now, for, those, for, for many of us in this room that, that know Jesus or maybe have been walking with Jesus for a while, the whole, the, just the very question seems so ridiculous, right? That the comparison is so unimaginable. It's, it's not even close. That Not even just if you got that one item. Jesus says, if you gained the whole world, if you got the whole thing, It's not going to compare to the rewards that await those who put their hope and faith in Jesus and in the cross. And the rewards that are going to come to that person when Jesus returns. It's not even close. Paul says, I consider it all garbage by comparison. Let me end with just a, just a, a couple of questions. What does a cross mean to you today? 
does it mean to you? And what might your own cross be in order to follow Jesus? I think of a, a couple of different um, stories. One uh, story I heard this week, and a true story, about a guy who was applying for med school and went in front of this, uh, this medical school board for an interview, and they're looking at his application, and they say, well, I see on your application that you're an evangelical Christian. He says, yes, I am. So does that mean that you, if called upon, would you uh, perform an abortion if necessary? He said, uh, I would not. I, w- I would never perform an abortion. The committee talks amongst themselves a little bit, and one guy responds to him, and he says, you won't perform an abortion even if that means getting into this school. Okay, what is his cross at this moment? What is it that he stands to lose in this moment? his response, his response was great. He said, I have no call from God to go to this school. He says, but I have a call from God to follow Jesus. Regardless of what that means for me, regardless of whatever's going to come of this interview, and uh, it eventually turned out they denied his request. He didn't get in. What is it going to cost me to follow Jesus? I think uh, also of a couple of friends um, that Sarah and I know, a couple of female friends who probably in the course of their uh, young lifetime had many opportunities to date guys, probably opportunities to, to get married if they really, really wanted to. And over the course of their 20s, early 30s, um, said, I will not date, I will not marry a man who I do not believe will lead my family spiritually. I won't do it. What is her cross in that moment? What is it that she stands to lose to make that stand for Jesus? And for years, we watched, we watched them struggle through this idea that, Lord, even if that means that I will never, ever get married, I am not compromising, um, I'm not compromising my relationship with you. The only person that I am willing to marry is somebody who loves you and is going to lead this family spiritually. What is your cross in that moment? And and what I find interesting is that when Jesus asks his disciples to consider that, what he's not asking them to consider is how much are you willing to endure? He's not asking them how much you're willing to to endure. He's asking them how much do you value the cross? You see the difference? Not how tough are you for Jesus, Not how much are you willing to put up with for Jesus, but how much do you value the cross? I want to close in in prayer here in a second, but what I would like for for us to do is just in your own, uh, in your own heart, in your own mind, um, let's open in prayer here and just take this moment to communicate to Jesus the value of the cross in your life. And if you're here and maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus, maybe the question for you is the same question he had for, for Peter. Is who do you say that I am? What does this cross mean to you? Or maybe you know Jesus, been walking with Jesus for years, and you've forgotten the value of the cross in your life. Take a minute. Um, Just spend some time with Jesus communicating the value the cross has in your life and I'll close in prayer.
Father, we recognize this morning how often we are like Peter. We have our own thoughts, we have our own agendas, we have our own ideas as to what you should or shouldn't be doing. Lord, forgive us of that. God, help us to be a people who have your concerns on our hearts, your concerns on our minds, that we would live our lives with the cross at the center of our lives, not our own whatever, not our own desires, not our own heart, Father, but the cross would be at the center of who we are, that the cross would be at the center of what we do, regardless of the implications, how others may view us, how others may treat us. Father, we want to follow you. We thank you, and we do pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together for the benediction.